my focus will be on a brief introduction of the topic of sepsis and, and some of the key principles for management. And I think that'll lead nicely into some of the other speakers. Uh, I've listed here my financial disclosures, but I wanna start with the classic triad that I think we're all familiar with that determines the outcome in many infectious diseases, including sepsis. And that is a balance between the patient, the organism and the therapy. And if we have therapy to choose, which is gonna be my focus, we of course have to consider <coughs> the patient's comorbidities and risk factors for specific types of infections and severity of infection. And we have to consider the organism uh, and the organism's virulence uh, and the dominance in a particular environment. And all of this leads to an appropriate choice of antibiotics, which in turn affects outcome. In understanding the site of onset of sepsis, uh, this study of over 2.2 million hospitalizations documented very nicely the community onset sepsis is far more common than hospital onset sepsis, yet hospital sepsis has a higher mortality than community onset sepsis. Uh, Dr. Vincent did a very important study, the EPIC-3 study, which was a surveillance study in 88 countries, over 15,000 ICU patients, a point prevalence study of sepsis on one day in multiple ICUs. 65% of all the patients in that study had one positive culture and gram negatives were the most common organisms. Gram positives were present nearly half as frequently as gram negatives. Many had mixed infections. And while gram negatives were present in 67%, fungi were in 16% and viruses in about 4%. Most common site of sepsis was respiratory tract infection, followed by abdominal infection, bloodstream infection, uh, urinary and kidney infection, and skin and CNS infections were less common. Infection with certain multidrug resistant pathogens, particularly vancomycin resistant enterococcus, resistant Klebsiella, and carbapenem resistant acinetobacter were all associated with an independent risk of mortality compared to others. And this may relate particularly to the difficulties in treating these multidrug resistant pathogens. Now, it's extremely important, I think we've known this for many years, how important it is to get appropriate and rapid therapy in patients with sepsis. Inappropriate therapy increases mortality, treatment failure, and length of stay. Uh, and in this meta-analysis of 114 studies, it was very clear with severe bacterial infection that mortality was particularly increased with delays in therapy. And delays in therapy and discordant therapy were much more likely if there were multidrug resistant pathogens. And I think that this is in keeping with the EPIC-3 data, that if we have multidrug resistant pathogens, particularly if we don't anticipate them, if we don't account for them in our initial empiric therapy, we will have a delay in the initiation of appropriate therapy, and that in turn is associated with increased mortality. And illustrated here from that study are the common pathogens that are frequently treated discordantly and the frequency of discordant therapy was particularly common with organisms like Enterobacteraceae and Enterococcus fecalis, uh, and particularly with Stenotrophomonas. So these are organisms that we have to be alert to. We have to know our own local microbiology. We have to know if these organisms are prevalent in our community, in our ICU, and we have to account for them if they're present with initial empiric therapy. There's a lower mortality with appropriate therapy without delay. And in the Prospero study, uh, this was particularly true uh, with severe bacterial infection. Six of the 37 studies uh, in this uh, analysis uh, were in ICU patients. And if we look particularly uh, at the impact of delays uh, on mortality, uh, we do not wanna have delays. We wanna favor early therapy. And that's particularly true for infections like pneumonia, for bacteremia, and particularly for those who are in the ICU. So the basic principle of antimicrobial therapy is to anticipate the likely etiologic pathogens, anticipate the site of infection, know your local microbiology, choose your therapy correctly, do it immediately, and as soon as possible, will reduce mortality. When we look at sepsis delays in the emergency department, this study pointed out very nicely that there are two types of delays that can occur uh, in the emergency department. There's a delay 
from triage to the administration of antibiotics, but that can be uh, the time from recognition uh, of the sepsis, from entry to recognition, and from recognition to therapy. And what was identified uh, is that more than one and a half hours of an administration delay and more than six hours in a recognition delay uh, are associated with increased mortality. So again, it's extremely important to recognize and treat sepsis in severely ill patients as early as possible. In a review article that was published last year in Critical Care, we discussed the initial antimicrobial therapy of sepsis, and we highlighted some of the key factors in choosing uh, the right and rapid therapy for patients with sepsis. And this requires a knowledge of local microbiology. You must know what the pathogens are in your ICU and what their susceptibility to antibiotics are. You need to consider the common sources of infection. We've talked about the lung, the abdomen, uh, and certainly uh, intravascular sepsis and urinary tract infection, <coughs> all important sources to consider in patients who have clinical sepsis. We must know the common pathogens, again, gram negatives more than gram positives, but anticipate specifically multi-drug resistant pathogens by considering multi-drug ris resistance risk factors, particularly prolonged hospital stay and recent antibiotic therapy. And of course, we have to consider the severity of illness. Patients who are particularly severely ill need to be recognized and treated as rapidly as possible. And all of these are the underlying principles for choosing the appropriate antibiotic. Now, rather than go into very specific guidelines for choosing antibiotics, which I will not do in the brief time I have today, I wanna to summarize some key principles that are in our article about how you manage the antibiotic therapy of sepsis. Sepsis, again, mandates prompt antibiotic therapy and source control. And as we saw, bacteria are the most common cause of sepsis, but viruses and fungi can also be responsible, but again, not nearly as commonly as bacteria. And among the bacteria, uh, we see that gram negatives are more common than gram positives and multi-drug resistant pathogens have to be considered because they're associated with frequently incorrect therapy, delays in appropriate therapy, and in turn, increased mortality. Use of initial appropriate therapy reduces mortality, length of stay, uh, and again, the likelihood of multi-drug resistant pathogen infection has to be considered in the context of local microbiology. And we have to give therapy as rapidly as possible for patients in septic shock, but no later than three to five hours in patients with severe sepsis, regardless of whether they're in septic shock. Biomarkers can be useful uh, in deciding uh, when to stop antibiotic therapy, but they shouldn't be determined a determination about when to use antibiotic therapy, particularly in patients with clinical sepsis. Even with appropriate therapy, we have to consider pharmacokinetics. We have to use the right dose. We have to often use higher than normal doses in septic patients because many of them have augmented renal clearance that requires a higher than normal dose uh, of antibiotic therapy. They can have alterations in cardiac output, volume of distribution, and we have to consider the penetration of the antibiotic to the site of infection. Empiric antibiotic therapy of septic patients with pneumonia should never be with a single agent, and we should choose based on risk factors for MDR pathogens. Generally, we use broad spectrum initial antibiotic therapy, but there's an obligation to de-escalate from the standpoint of antimicrobial stewardship so they don't overutilize and abuse antibiotics. And the most important risk factors to consider when choosing empiric therapy or not only, again, local microbiology, but as I mentioned, recent use of broad-spectrum antibiotics anytime in the last three months, recent hospitalization for at least five days in the last three months, and a knowledge of prior colonization or infection, particularly by pathogens like MRSA or Pseudomonas. For complicated intra-abdominal infection, we have to recognize this is often a polymicrobial infection. It can involve gram-negatives, anaerobes, enterococci, and initial empiric therapy is often with a beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor combination, or with a carbapenem. And in some patients, Canada has to be targeted, and we add coverage specifically for intra-abdominal fungal infection. But importantly, antibiotics are often not enough for abdominal infection. It's important to consider source control with percutaneous or surgical drainage of intra-abdominal abscess. For bacteremia, there is a syndromic 
approach based on whether or not we have a prior positive culture. And with rapid diagnostic methods, we're identifying the etiologic pathogen and even the antimicrobial susceptibility much more rapidly than in the past. And this may allow us to treat correctly more rapidly. And fungal infection finally does need to be considered. It accounts for about 5% of all sepsis, most commonly due to Canada. And it can often be predicted by the Canada prediction scores, epidemiologic data, microbiologic information, even fungal biomarkers like galactomannan and beta-D-glucan. And risk factors for fungal infection overlap with other etiologic causes of ICU sepsis. So often we're forced to do preemptive and empiric therapy uh, with uh, a variety of antifungal agents, kind of candens for Canada, uh, but that may not even be the, the correct choice in all instances because increasingly we're having Canada resistance. So I've tried to very briefly highlight some of the considerations for therapy of sepsis, identifying the common pathogens, the common sources, the general approach to therapy. And we can come back to this later when we discuss some of the very specific antibiotic choices in patients with very specific causes of sepsis. So thank you for your attention and we'll move on with our program.